thinking about those songs, I had a, a thought when I was, uh, this morning I shared it with the team in the back and I told them I wasn't going to share it out here, but it, the, the songs led me right to it with the idea of vision. Uh, yesterday I spent a day with a lot of dust in the air, uh, so I was cleaning out a barn uh, with a a blower and some other things, and then uh, the farmer right next door was harvesting his soybeans. Uh, and so we, we had a whole day of just, just one cloud, and then on top of that, of course, the wind was a little blustery yesterday, and so things were all blowing in the air. And so today, uh, it's kind of a, uh, you know me, that if you've been around here, that when I worship, often uh, the joy just kind of leaks out my eyes very frequently. Uh, it's been a kind of a cleansing thing this morning because my eyes were itchy and scratchy all day yesterday. Uh, and this morning they woke up crusty uh, with the stuff that, that I had there. But it made me think about, right, really one of the reasons that we're here today is to get our vision back. You know, over the week, uh, we've gotten our vision skewed and we've forgotten God's goodness and greatness. Maybe we've forgotten our own identity as we've tried to fight for reality in the face of the social media that we're in. We've gotten worried by the circumstances of the political uh, scene where we are and some of the crazy things that are going on. And today, we need to, we need to be able to get our vision restored, uh, that God is good that he's ruling and reigning, and that he has stepped in in history in Jesus Christ to deal with all the things that truly threaten us and to provide for us everything that we truly need. And so this is what we want to do today in our communion. And today in particular, I want to uh, focus on a particular dimension of our communion celebration uh, and talk about it as a meal, a meal. There's a lot of different uh, images that are uh, gathered together in Jesus' command for us to do this. Uh, this was particularly, uh, this particular image was front and center when I was a young Christian, uh, listening to uh, Tommy and Shelby and Becca talk about growing up. I grew up in a church that made a big deal of communion, uh, and they did it once a quarter. Uh, and so we do it here once a month. They would do it once a quarter. Uh, and my mom and dad were up to their neck in, in involvement. My dad was a deacon in the church, and my mom, I don't know if what she was on the official cooking team or something like that, uh, but she would, they would labor all day uh, to make a meal. Uh, they would bake the unleavened bread uh, and make it into wafers that you could uh, break across the table from your neighbor. Uh, and then the tables would be set up in, in our, our basement that was our auditorium. Uh, for these events, and they would set the uh, uh, tables up, and you would set across the table, and we were divided uh, uh, along uh, men and women because they practiced foot washing. And when I was young, uh, I would thought, you know, for often you would think, well, how does, a, how does a kid process that? I have very, very warm memories of uh, a, a dad in the faith standing up next to me uh, gird, uh, with a big, long towel that was for these things, after he would kneel down, wash my feet, and then stand up, and then embrace me, and then put the towel around me. And then I would do the next one and on the way across. And then I remember at the time of breaking the bread, where instead of it being something that I personally did uh, by myself, I would look across the table, I would pick up, it looked like a, uh, a mushy uh, saltine cracker, right, if you want to put it that way. And I would hold it across the table, and someone across the table would take the other side, and we would break it together. And then we would drink uh, the cup. We didn't have a common cup. We didn't have those. But, but I remember those uh, moments and celebrating that it was a time of a meal, a time of a celebration. Now, when you look, when you look at Scripture, one of the many ways that Scripture uh, pictures the beauty of God's character is through the concept of a meal, and that God sits down, and one of the beauties of God's character is that he makes provision for those that he loves, and he welcomes them to come and eat it. And, you know, it's one of the things, uh, my mom, if you were to ask her here, I don't know if there is such a, I, don't, I didn't know this one, I think it would be lumped under um, acts of service, right, if we're all love language people. Uh, but my mom, the best thing that she would love to do would be to make a meal for someone. Uh, so often when we go down there, her only real disappointment at times when I visit is if I leave without her having made a meal, uh, because I need to eat a meal. My grandmother was like that too, uh, but that was her way uh, to show that she loved the people in her life and she would labor over it uh, and uh, welcome us to a meal 
and then sit down, I should say, uh, sometimes very temporarily because she was always up to do something right at it, but she wanted us to enjoy the meal. Now, this can recall that when we think about God, this is probably one of the most famous statements that talk about God as a host at a, at a banquet. And this is in Psalm 23, and you'll recognize this one. This is right at the end of the psalm. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will welcome, will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now you take that image, and let's jump forward roughly in the biblical storyline about a thousand years. And we get to the most vivid and important picture of God as the welcoming host. This time it's Jesus, the Son of God, inviting those he loves to share a meal he has prepared for them in the presence of his enemies. And here's what Matthew says. If you want to read along with me, I'm going to be in Matthew 26. I'm going to be in a lot of, of, of verses today as we pick up this imagery. But maybe this one is here, one that I want to encourage you to take a look at. I'm going to read a little bit in Matthew 26, uh, and we'll skip down a little bit and read a little bit later. So Matthew 26, and we're going to begin at verse 17. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, in verse 17, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So the disciples were wanting to serve Jesus uh, and prepare the Passover, this very, very important feast that commemorates, right, the deliverance of the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage. But it was the culmination, if you remember, of those, those seven plagues. Uh, but this was the one, the Passover meal was the one that God invited them to enjoy uh, not only as nourishment from him, but also as a picture of his welcome of them and his protection over them. So they were to kill the Passover lamb, take the blood from the sacrifice, put it on the doorpost to signal their allegiance and submission to Yahweh, to the God of their fathers, and God's wrath passed over them by virtue of that sacrifice. And so they're thinking that uh, they want to celebrate this sacrifice, and so they're, they're as, as, as good uh, uh, circumspect Jews, and they want to prepare for their master, their Rabboni, their teacher, uh, for him to enjoy it. In verse 18, he replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near, I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. <clears throat> now, here I went, sometimes, we've, uh, sometimes we can over-miraculize, uh, if that's such a word, make Jesus more miraculous than he is. Uh, Jesus is miraculous enough, we don't need to overdo it, right, in terms of that. But in, in this one, what we know from the gospel stories is that Jesus took deliberate steps to prepare and set up this whole occasion. We're at the Passover, there's literally thousands of people that rush into Jerusalem, and you would have need to make advanced preparations to be able to have a room where you could celebrate the Passover, the famous upper room as we refer to it. Well, Jesus had made advanced preparations. Here they wanted to ask him about how to set it up for him, and he had already made preparations, and he wanted them to come to a table that he had prepared for them. He was the host at the table. So he says, I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus has directed them and prepared the Passover. Now come down to verse 26. <clears throat> While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Right. Now, the weight of that on a Jewish audience, this is my body. Now, this is not in commemoration, past historical event. This is a commemoration of what is yet to occur that that past event looked forward to. That that past event is only ultimately significant because I'm going to fulfill everything it pictured. 
everything it promised that God's wrath would ultimately be satisfied, his just requirement of punishment of sin would ultimately be satisfied, and I am the Passover lamb. So take and eat. This is my body. Then verse 27, then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now what Jesus is referring to, as his disciples would know, is the promise that comes through Jeremiah and Ezekiel that we refer to often as the new covenant. This new arrangement that God's going to bring about where he's going to transform the individual by giving them the spirit of God and take the law, his own character and passions and priorities, and write it on their very being. He's going to regenerate them, restore them. He's going to remove the offenses between them and him and restore this fellowship and welcome that he has. And he's going to put his mark of ownership on them. They become his purchased possession. This is that new covenant, right? Is this blood is going to seal that new arrangement where your sins will be forgiven, you'll be righted with God, and you'll know all that God has created you to enjoy. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So even here, Jesus says that this banquet is a foretaste, a picture, a prefigurement, a foreshadowing of the ultimate banquet that's yet to come, the ultimate place of provision and nourishment and welcome that awaits for all of God's people. Now, at this moment, we find Jesus inviting his disciples to come to a meal that not only nourishes them in the moment, but pictures the ultimate, fully satisfying nourishment and welcome he will provide through his life, death, and resurrection. Right? The biblical storyline, as we've talked about all along, right, it begins with God the Creator creating humanity in an environment that was meant for their blessing, for their flourishment, for their joy, that was maximized for them to flourish in. They rejected him and rebelled against him. And because God is just, God brought his curse upon the world and upon them. But because he's a God of mercy, he did not end them. So he moves them out of the garden. And the whole biblical storyline is the question, how are we going to get back into the welcome of God? How are we going to get back into God's provision when we've cut ourselves off from it? And what's very clear as we read the whole biblical story is that we've created a problem for ourselves that we can't remedy. Uh, just as we've been going through the book of Romans, by nature and by choice, we're bent away from God. We want our own way. We want to be God in his place. We want to co-opt him to do what we want him to do. This is a nourishment that Jesus is going to provide and a welcome that they will know in part now. Right? And this is one of the things that Jesus is going to make clear. Right? He's going to say, this welcome that I'm offering you through my life, de uh, death, and resurrection, this welcome is going to be something you're only going to know in part in this life. One day we'll be sitting down at a banquet when everything that I promised you will be realized. Because right after this, what is going to happen? Jesus is going to go to the cross. And they're going to follow him on that path. So it looks beyond itself to the banquet of all banquets. That is the fullness of everything that we long for. You know, one of the images of heaven, right? And this is, this is something that I remember as a young man in particular. Uh, somebody would read from the book of Revelation, right? Revelation chapter 4 and 5, right? Sometime you just want to take it this afternoon and read through Revelation 4 and 5. It's the heavenly scene where all of the, the, the beings, the people who have died and gone before, where the angelic beings, the seraphim and the cherubim, where all of them are gathered uh, singing praise to the creator and redeemer of all mankind. It's a, it's a glorious picture. But it, in my youth, when I was little, I, I remember leaning over to someone and saying, is that all we do in heaven? We just sing songs all the time? Right? That doesn't sound, you know, very exciting. Like, do we shoot anybody or do we run up and tackle things or do we, you know, what, what kind of things do we eat? You know, all those kind of things like that I thought as a young kid, right, in terms of that. But as I've grown up, I realized that the, 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 the thing that's being celebrated is, is being in the presence of the God who made you. 
And that heaven primarily is focused on the access you have to the very God who made you. And as I've grown older, right, and, and we know as a cliche, is that there are so many things in life that are fun and interesting, but the older you get, the more important it becomes who you do them with and who you do them for. And apart from them, they lose kind of their richness and their sweetness. And the idea of heaven is that we'll be in a forever in a place where we have immediate access to the God who's made us. And so we won't have any distance between us caused by our sin, caused by our brokenness, but we'll be have open, intimate fellowship with Him. You know, when I, I at Cedarville, I get to see all kinds of budding relationships at Cedarville. Right? And there's all kinds of jokes that happen there. You start off with a couple that's well, way afar from each other. Right? If they have any social sense, they don't immediately try to go after each other closely, physically. And so slowly they get on this, this kind of carousel and they wind their way toward each other. And as they wind their way toward each other, they start standing closer to each other. They start maybe holding hands together. Then they become the proverbial Velcro couple, as they're called at Cedarville. Right, as if, uh, you know, she has the little hooks and he has the, you know, the other pad and then, you know, they're kind of stuck together. Uh, and they can't sit close enough to one another, right? They're, they're in absolute pain if they're away from each other for a whole 50-minute class. I mean, that's absolute torture. Uh, but what you find, right, is, is the natural course of love is that it wants to be with its beloved. That's the natural course of love. You want to be with your beloved, And you know when something's broken in your relationship is when you move away from your beloved. And so the ultimate end of our life is to have everything that's that's blinding us to the deep need that we have. And it's interesting that heaven is described as a yearning for us that will be fulfilled when the Father looks at us as His children and says, well done, my son, well done, my daughter. That we yearn for the affirmation of God. And so this picture is the picture, Jesus' invitation of the fact that we have an ultimate human yearning to have access to our Father, to have Him welcome us, and we desperately need His provision, right? Jesus Himself was the one that says, man will not live by what? Bread alone, but by, by what? By every word which proceeds from the mouth of the Father, right? So we need Him. So as we come to the Lord's table by His invitation, All who have believed in Christ and submitted to Him as Lord are being reminded of God's undeserved, lavish, indescribable welcome and provision that came to us and will forever come to us through the Son by the powerful working of the Spirit. So let's talk about just a few. I just want to list some things. What what did Jesus do? Well, Jesus gave Himself for us while we were still His enemies. Right, we're going to read in the book of Romans, it'd be really surprising, right? even surprising for a man to die for a righteous man or for even a woman to die for a good man, but who on earth would die for their enemies? But God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the Lord that we serve. Jesus did this willingly in obedience to the Father to express the Father's love because it was the love he shared, right? You got the Father and the Son, right, conspiring together to rescue people who hate them, right? That's that's the nourishment to our soul. It was the Spirit who affected all of these changes, right? The Spirit of God who's at work. He affected what we sang about this, our freedom from our willing bondage to sin and its consequences, right? We were forgiven, right? That whole idea that when we were bought back by Christ's sacrifice, he paid the price to, to cover our sins, and he not only broke the bondage of sin over us, Pastor Steve was talking about this in chapter 3, we were under sin, we were under its authority, and we were under its judgment, well, he did, he did away with both of those. He broke the power of sin so that we could sing like we sang today. And so at the same time, he removed all the consequences for our sin. So whatever your past is, whatever your present is, the darkest things that are happening, Jesus took those all into himself and freed you from their consequences. That's what he's done, right? And the Spirit's made that happen. He recreated us and gave us a foretaste of the fullness of joy that will come when Christ returns. 
right? The Spirit of God made us new. He gave us new appetites. He gave us new desires, right? He's at work in us in His mercy to convict us of sin, to say, I love you too much. Don't go down that path. And the Spirit has now marked us as His property so that we're secure in Christ, right? I am not dependent upon the right people getting in office on Tuesday to secure my life. I'm not dependent upon my doctor to give me the best uh, diagnosis to secure my life. I'm not even dependent, even though I don't have to worry about this with Ron, I'm not dependent on her making the right choices today for me to be secure in everything that God has given me. And thank God she doesn't have to be dependent upon me. So God has done that and offered that to us, and he's put his spirit within us to say, you're my property. I own you, and I want to bring you to life. And a part of that, he's adopted us into his family. He's made us his own, right? So he took enemies through Jesus, and he's made us sons and daughters, right? So what we're saying, Lord, be thou my vision, right? That's who you are. You're a son or daughter of Christ. You are a redeemed rebel, a hopeless sinner that has now been made a son or a daughter. That's who you are. And we need to get our vision cleared that that's our identity by the Spirit of God. So these all came to us when the Spirit brought us into the benefits of Christ, right? He united us with Christ. Even the very response of faith, we needed the Spirit to enable us because we were dead. We were dead. We were zombies. And the Spirit comes and quickens life in us, right? If you want to get a wonderful verbal picture of that, you need to pull out, and can it be, right? It's the imagery of being broken out of a dungeon. of. So Jesus instituted this meal as a perpetual reminder of his boundless love for us as his people. And with the meals we eat every day, this meal is meant to sustain and strengthen our lives. It is meant to sustain and strengthen our faith. As we reflect on what Christ did for us in fulfillment of God's promises, it will fill us with joy and strengthen our confidence in the certainty and reality of the hope that we have in Christ, the hope that all that we long for will be filled, fulfilled. Let me read Romans 5, 1 and 2, right? We're going to get here a little bit in our series. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, since we've been righted with God, through belief in Jesus, chapter 5, verse 1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Now, peace here is not an absence of conflict, right? Like uh, Rosie and Jason stop fighting, but they've got, they're just looking it over glaring. No, they're, they're not this morning, I don't think. But they've stopped fighting, and you just draw them back. Nobody's saying any bad words. Nobody's doing anything necessarily. So there is a, a kind of a quiet in the home. The peace that he's talking about here is that there's, an, there's a, a relationship that is flourishing. There's a welcome that's being experienced. There's an intimacy that's being enjoyed. This kind of peace is a kind of relationship that makes the two people flourish in it. So this is God, the judge, who because of what Christ has done has removed everything that stood him over against us in his wrath and now he embraces us as children. So that's the peace we have. So we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Right? I don't know if you, just to, to celebrate the idea that you live in the land of grace. Right? You live in the land of grace. Day after day, from God through the Spirit comes His blessings to you day after day. Well, what is one of those? You need not worry about what anybody's going to do in this world because your future is completely secure. Right? And, and you know what life is about because you know who Jesus is and what He's called you to do and to be. You don't have to wonder about your identity. You don't have to look to other people to tell you who you are. You don't need affirmation from outside yourself. You live in a land of grace where Christ comes to you and says, you are my beloved. You are my beloved. You are my sons and daughters. I created you for your joy and your blessing. Trust me. Follow me. Lean in on me today. That's the land of grace. And sometimes His grace comes to you through the people that are in this room. The people in this room, they're, they're just like conveyor belts of grace, right? You're messed up. You can't see anything. Your vision's all blurry, right? You just walk through behind the combine and the soybeans, right? You can't see anything. And somebody walks up to you and embraces you and leads you out of the darkness of your depression 
or you're suffering and says, God loves you. He's here with you. Right? So you live in the land of grace, right, where his favor comes toward you every day to move you more and fully into life. In this grace in which we now stand and we boast in hope of the glory of God, right? We hope and look forward to with a confident, eager expectation that everything that we long for be realized. And because we do that, we don't get hoodwinked when somebody tries to tell us that the world can give us what we truly long for. It lets us let loose of our money. It lets us let loose of our reputation. It lets us let loose of our life itself. Because what is awaiting us is the fulfillment of everything we long for. I can't have enough money to satisfy the deep yearnings in my soul. I can't have enough people like me to satisfy those affirmations. I can't look good enough. I can't have a powerful enough position. None of those will scratch that itch. But that's the issue. So as we reflect on what Christ has done, it will satisfy our souls, but reminded us of God's goodness and greatness, of what God has created us to be and is redeeming us to become, of what will give our lives purpose and meaning. Jesus invites us to come and eat with God at this table of blessing and abundance. Our communion table is God's table spread for his people. It pictures the welcome we enjoy in God's presence and the abundant lavish provision he has made and continues to make for his people in Christ by the Spirit. And Jesus, when he ate the first such meal with his disciples, here we recall and celebrate God's blessings in Christ by the Spirit as a foretaste of the fulfillment of all we long for and are promised by God in the age to come when Christ returns. It calls us upward to God, it calls us out toward each other, and it calls us out to a world who doesn't know the land of grace. So, who can eat of this table? Right? We, at, we at Emmanuel, we practice what's called open communion, meaning that we do not require a person to be a member of the church to be able to participate. The only requirement to participate in this table is if you know Jesus Christ as the one who's delivered you and as the one that you have given your life to, to serve and to love. And so who can celebrate from this meal, right? You're invited to this table if you have recognized and admitted your rebellion and sin against God. Somebody says, well, that's negative. No, it's not negative. For you to recognize who you are and what you have done is one of the most healthy things that you can do. We live in a moment where people are desperately trying to defy reality, right? Desperately trying to defy reality. And you need to embrace the reality that I don't care who you are, I don't care how good you are, I don't care how nice you are, you can't live up to your own standard. And the standard that God gives is so far beyond us that it should bring us to our, the end of ourselves, not to a list of our goodness, And so you're welcome if you admitted your rebellion and sin against God, if you have turned from yourself and anything else that you were putting your trust in for finding genuine life, right? This is what Bible describes as repentance is based on what you know of who you are and you know of who God is. You turn away from a formal way of life and you cast yourself on the mercy of God. If you have transferred that trust to what Christ has done for you on the cross, taking the consequences of your sin upon himself and providing a right standing with God, if you're actively submitting to his will for your relationship with him. Now, every believer is invited to this table. So if you've come to know Christ, you're invited. But one of the things that we know, right, about this communion, and we're going to have it here in just a moment, is it's a checkup time for us as believers. Because God knows... Right? And that's the reason Jesus came, because the desperate need we have is not for a better job, not for more health, not for more popularity, not for more power. We need a transformation that makes us sinners into saints. That can't happen through any of those. We need a transformation. But also, once God brings us to himself, we're on this path of growth, and he loves us and wants us to walk in the path of his love. And so when we come to this communion, which celebrates what Christ did to take us from the kingdom of darkness and place us into the kingdom of light, right? To take us from people who are under God's wrath to people who enjoy his eternal welcome and presence. Well, now he's calling us back. Don't, don't take up the old way of life. I love you too much to let you miss out on what I want you to know and miss out on the effectiveness that I want you to have in the lives of other people who need to know this land of grace. 
And so it's a time for us as Christians to come and say, Lord, am I neglecting you? Have I forgotten that you're the center of life? Have I turned to you? Have I made uh, somebody's behavior an excuse for ignoring what you ask of me? All those. So we're going to give an opportunity. You're invited to come if you know Jesus, but also if you know Jesus, you're invited to come if you're willing to submit to him because it's his mercy that draws us away from the things that kill us. Jesus tells us not to come to a time of worship, right, where we declare our allegiance to God and ask for his blessings while we're harboring hatred toward our brother or sister. So here is Jesus' words. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there on the front of the altar and first go and be reconciled to them, then come offer your gift. Paul warns us, right, when we get to 1 Corinthians 11, that we should not eat if our relationships with God's people does not reflect what Christ wishes for us. It is a time for us to reflect for our blessing. So God spreads a table before us in the midst of our enemies, right? I I want to think about this for a moment, right? It's interesting that, that it's embedded in the Christian tradition that the words that were kept, that Paul kept using in church after church, is it says, on the night that he was betrayed. He institutes this welcome, this table, in the face of his betrayal, right? And so it reminds us, right, that Jesus offers this table in the midst of a world that's hostile against him and his people. And it's nourishment that can sustain us, right? So in the midst of our enemies, he calls us away from a hostile world to unite us more closely in our common bonds in Christ, and to nourish us for living as his people, for our blessing, the blessing of those to whom he's called in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, right? This, I've said this before in different places, what the people in your life need who don't know Jesus is they need a you full of Jesus. They need a you full of Jesus. They don't need a clever Christian who's trying to be incognito for Jesus, They don't need a a person who's trying to basically stay quiet and not identify with Jesus and somehow be good enough that people will be forced to ask what's going on in your life. He's asking you to openly identify with him. And I'm not talking about being rude or nasty or those kinds of things, but just as any husband in here, hopefully you publicly and openly identify with your wife, then we ought to do this above all with Jesus. So he warns us. So God spreads the table in the midst of our enemies. And then he calls us to nourish ourselves on all these riches. And I just laid out some of them for myself. We need, so here's, here's Paul's word in Ephesians 1. Here's some riches, right? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Right? So what in the world is he referring to? Forgiveness from our sins. Okay? Now, Sometimes people have belittled salvation by thinking it's more than forgiveness of sins. But I want to tell you, if it isn't forgiveness of sins, all the other benefits don't happen. Right? They don't happen. Because God is a just God. He just doesn't say, ah, no no big deal. And God doesn't waffle around and change his mind. No, we have offended him. And it's the height of offenses. This is the thing here, biblically speaking. The offense against your creator, the one who made you, the one who gave you life, the one who sustains the very world in which you live, the one who offers you, to sin against him is the height of offenses. It makes every other offense to every other person just a piddling thing. The weight of that is something we cannot bear, we cannot remove from our shoulders. But now forgiveness is to take something that was between me and God that shaped his relationship with me and God removes it out there so that he can have a relationship as a son or a daughter. That's very different. So forgiveness of sins, freedom from our slavery to sin and death. Okay? Now, it doesn't promise us that we won't physically die. Maybe Christ will return before then, but we won't physically die. But it means that our coffin will never be the final word. Right? That this life is not all there is. That God himself has overcome death and Jesus' empty tomb testifies to that. He's overcome death. So we're freedom from the slavery sin. I don't have to sin today. I don't have to do the things. Right? I, I enjoyed Shelby's testimony talking about her own struggle with depression. 
Shelby's struggle is a struggle that you could multiply a thousand times over in her generation. Who offers hope for you in the darkness of despair? Jesus offers hope, real hope for that. Peace between us and our Heavenly Father and eternal welcome from Him. We're enabled to love and enjoy being loved, right? Here's, here's one of the things that happens. God's busy taking your selfishness is how we're wired as sinful, right? As sinful people, the key thing we want to do is we want our, to elevate ourselves, right? We want to be people who are elevated. We want people to think well of us. We, we ask the question after every event that we've had how we came off by virtue of the event that happened, right? We just want applause, right? And we keep trying to get it from the wrong resource or the wrong sources. We want it ultimately from God, but we don't want to submit to Him. We don't want to bow the knee to Him and say, I'm broken. God, please do for me what I can't do so that we can his, hear His well done. So we try to short circuit that by getting the social media's well done or our friends well done or our boyfriend and girlfriend's well done or whatever the case may be. And ultimately that will never satisfy. And so constantly our relationships are distorted because we're always trying to get from those people what we need. Instead, when Christ reorients us and satisfies us, we move into people's lives to give them what God has given us for them. And it doesn't mean that God's not going to use them to bring his blessings to us. But fundamentally, I don't love my wife or my daughters because if they don't love me, my life is going to fall apart. I love them because I have been loved. I love them because I have been loved. And also, I hopefully, by God's grace, I love them toward what God has created them to be and wants to redeem them to become. So, Enabled by love, we're called to live lives of purpose, meaning and blessing. We're not called to live lives that we, we wander around and try to get somebody on social media and TikTok to tell us what's worth doing, right? We have a life of purpose. We have grace as enablement for life struggles and challenges. I look at uh, um, Sister Rhonda sitting here, right? I pray for Rhonda as she struggles physically with, uh, with the ailments that she has because I know that and I trust that the God who came to die for her, loves her so deeply that he cares about her suffering. He knows it more than she does. And that his power that's in that resurrection grave, that empty grave, is sufficient for her to bear up under that. And so I pray for God's grace to be poured into her life as his mercy for her so that she doesn't despair, that she doesn't lose hope, that she doesn't try to turn to something to try to short-circuit it other than turning to Jesus. So a place to belong among God's people, right? If you've ever known someone who's never had any place to belong, right? And then they walk in here and say, hey, hey, Emily, this is a uh, cow farmer, right? And Emily, Sarah, Marty, Jared, you're not only known by name, but you're loved by the people here and you belong here. And I, I know I've said this over and over again, but I don't want you to forget it. We have more real lasting bonds between any of us who know Jesus than any of our closest relatives who have rejected Jesus. Right? We have that by God's grace. So today, I want to reflect on the gifts and give thanks. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. I want to give praise Right, here's Philippians 4. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. So we reflect on the gifts. May we be humble, right, and confess where we've spurned those gifts or we've taken for granted. So before we pray here and we pause to reflect, I want to suggest, to, I want to ask you, do you need to come to Christ for the first time today? Christ has died for you. He has loved you. He has shed his blood for you. And you didn't deserve it. But he did it because you couldn't help yourself. And he offers you life. I, I beg of you in the name of Christ, would you, would you take that offer that he might bring you to life? Do you need to get your relationship between you and Christ restored through confession? If you're a follower of Jesus here today, is there something that, that you need to deal with? Do you got a creeping bitterness in your heart because circumstances are not going well and you're aggravated with God? 
Have you got something with regards to how you've spoken to somebody this week that you need to clear up and clear up with them? You need to come to him about your fears so that God's become very small and your fears have become really large. Do you need to take steps today to, to heal a relationship that's broken? And we're going to give it time to pray. And I want to give you an opportunity uh, to let the Lord work in your heart. So would you bow your heads with me as we prepare for our time? And so I want to give you a time just to ask the Lord to search your heart and let him bring things to your mind. Repent of those before the Lord. Thank him for his forgiveness. Ask him for strength and mercy. Lord Jesus, Lord, we, we humbly bow our hearts before you and we ask you to examine our hearts, Lord. Lord, would you be so kind as to show us anything that is not pleasing to you? Lord, would you reveal any secret pride any unconfessed sin. Any rebellion or unforgiveness that may be hindering our relationship with you. Lord, we know that we are your beloved children. Lord, that we have received you by your grace into our heart and lives and Lord, by your grace have accepted your death as penalty for our sins. Lord, the price you paid covered us for all time and our desire is to live for you. Lord, please grow our faith, Lord, to trust you so that we welcome the words of the convicting spirit and respond with repentance. Lord, would you be so kind as to save us from the sins that we love? Lord, would you help us to enter into the joy of your forgiveness when we confess and repent? Lord, help us to accept that, Lord, when you forgive, we are forgiven. Lord, deliver us from the evil one who wants to take us back and to deny that you are faithful and just to forgive and try to get us to wallow in, uh, to be uh, broken by, uh, Lord, our failures and sins. Lord, please, Lord, would you help us to enter into the grace and joy of your forgiveness. Thank you, God, that you are a God who is rich in mercy and slow to anger. Thank you that you are a God who loves us too much to let us go off into our sin. In the name of the one who has taken our penalty onto himself, so that we might know your provision and welcome. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.